think it's safe to say, as time marches forward, we all get old. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, if you're an old fuck like me, you'll know that time is just something that refuses to slow down. Some things might just seem like yesterday, when in reality that thing that you fondly remember turns out to have happened over a decade ago, making you wonder what the hell you've been doing with your entire life. And hopefully that segues us nicely into the topic of today's video. Because in order to get a greater understanding of how precious time actually is, we need to take our clocks and turn them all the way back to 2014. It was the first year of the 8th generation of consoles, when memes still looked like this, Ubisoft's biggest falsely advertised game release, and was the year of a particular character, who only by me showing you this silhouette should spark fond memories in the mind of anybody that sees it. Yes, can you fucking believe it, ladies and gentlemen? On this day, or the day after, depending on when it would be the best time to upload this video to appease my corporate overlord, Five Nights at Freddy's was released a whopping 10 years ago. Go. It literally just seems like yesterday when Let's Player after Let's Player after Let's Player was covering this game. Matt Pat wasn't close to retiring at all, and the lore wasn't convoluted enough yet to cause Kojima to bust a nut. It's insane to think that this little point and click horror game where a bunch of PNGs and GIFs jump scare you with loud noises left such a humongous impact. And that actually got me thinking. Yeah! In a way, Five Nights at Freddy's had a humongous impact on both horror gaming as well as pop culture. And since this is the funny or 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 bear's 10th birthday, the perfect age where certain YouTubers will start taking notice, I think it's time for us to take a stroll back through memory lane and talk about the impact that Five Nights at Freddy's had on gaming 10 years later. But before all of that, here's an intro. Now I'm sure everybody should probably know the humble beginnings to this furry bait animatronic, but since I'm a YouTuber who likes milking people of all their watch time like Cell's first appearance in Dragon Ball Z, I think it's only appropriate to see how such a small project that would inevitably have such a large impact got its start. And in order to do that, we need to talk about one man. Scott Cawthon. Besides being the one to tell MatPat none of his theories were right, he started off his game development career by developing games to an audience primarily outside of what we know him for today. Early games of his dating all the way back to 2012, and this includes stuff like Pilgrim's Progress and The Desolate Hope. And whilst these two projects were generally well received, in Scott's own words, they weren't enough to financially support his family. One year later, Scott submitted another game that I think you'll be a little bit more familiar with to Steam Greenlight, and that was Chip and Sons Lumber Company, a resource management game with characters that would spark nightmares into the most battle-hardened soldiers. So much so to the point that I think this is what the game was the most notable for. I myself have never really played this game and I'm not really sure if I want to. Not just because I'm already a little bitch from playing his later games, but I'm just not the biggest fan of resource collecting games. The only exception to this rule I have is stuff like Minecraft and on the occasion Rust, if I want to be called a good slur every once in a while. And I'm not entirely sure what the game's over reception was back then when it launched, but if going off from what I've read on Wikipedia, I don't really think reception was all too positive, and reading further on what said reception did to Scott's mental health, it sure seemed to take a toll on the guy. But after taking Chipper and Son's criticism to heart, Scott decided to steer his new game in a different direction, and on the 15th of June 2014, we got our first sneak peek at gaming history.
Yes, everybody, welcome to the earliest footage we got to see of Five Nights at Freddy's. And what better way to start the trailer than the man himself, FNAF Freddy Bear. This 34 second trailer is pretty much now immortalized in the video game Hall of Fame. And this trailer was already a great sign of things to come. We got to see Fur Affinity's biggest mascot greet an applauding crowd of children, followed by the text, during the day, it's a place of joy, followed then by us seeing the rest of the crew with Chica and Bonnie. And then the most ominous message shows up directly after, but you aren't here during the day. <laughs> then we switch through different cameras showing this Chuck E. Cheese inspired location during the evening, followed by us having the night watch. Well, no shit. Your previous text card already spoiled that. After that, we switch back to a close-up of the animatronics. I mean, makes sense. We don't want people making off with these finely crafted mechanical wonders. Oh, I seem to have drawn their attention. Then afterwards, we get the tags to this game. Limited power, limited visibility, and most importantly, limited time. Sounds like the average living experience in South Africa. Oh, and I forgot to mention that we at the very least also get to see Bonnie wandering the hallways at night and decide to get extremely close and intimate with whatever camera this is supposed to be. Don't know why he's so special in this trailer, because this game isn't even named after him. But in any case, after all of that, we finally get the reveal of the game's title, Five Nights at Freddy's. Now, I will admit that this is a trailer of all time. I mean, it does everything that you need it to. It doesn't show you gameplay for starters, so it's following the traditional standards of the time, but it did definitely set a mood and atmosphere perfectly, without really showing you a whole lot and leaving shit up to interpretation. It's kind of like how the game's lore is nowadays if you really think about it. But I need to preface something here real quick. I, like many others, got introduced to FNAF through I am a, a fish. fish. So I'm genuinely curious to hear from those when the game's initial hype wave was originally circulating. Was this trailer enough to sell you on this game alone? Because I can't help but look at this trailer from the perspective of when this game was released and would think to myself that this would genuinely be something to keep an eye out. The only reason I can guarantee you people look back on this trailer fondly nowadays is that, you know, it's the first FNAF games trailer, knowing obviously how big the franchise became after this. But looking at it before FNAF actually released, I just really really want to know, did this catch the eyes of anybody back in the day? I know I'm getting sidetracked, but this is just really something I'm curious to learn about. In any case, Scott spent a total of six months developing the game, with friends and family serving as game beta testers. He made the game using Click Team Fusion 2.5 and used Autodesk 3DS Max to model 3D graphics. The game's sound was also produced by Scott using a bunch of sound effects he created himself, as well as some sounds that he found on the internet. The most notable one being the jump scare noise for when you have no no choice but to succumb to a war fetish. For those of you who didn't know, the animatronics' beautiful pipes were originally uttered by actress Judy Geeson in the 1981 film Inseminoid. And if you're wondering why this poster as well as this scene is heavily blurred, you're an adult, look that shit up for yourself. But that's enough reminiscing for now, because after all of this yapping, I finally get to talk about the actual game. So you know, let's just jump back to 2014 and see what made FNAF become such an industry icon in the first place. Yes, I am 100% sure that this menu and those sounds alone was enough to send nostalgic shivers down your spine. Or the sight of Freddy Fazbear made you giggle just a tiny little bit because of the fact that there's damning video evidence that proves that he's an interpretive dancer. Any case, ladies and gentlemen, here we are. The, the main menu. The one main menu that started it all, mind you. There's the title. There's our two options that will later become three. There's the analog horror green screen overlay effect. And there's a character that I'm pretty sure a few of you have a very special folder for on your PC. This is where it all began. And upon clicking that new game button, this is where the fun finally begins. We get that ever so iconic newspaper article where Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria is looking for somebody to work the night shift. And after that, here we finally go. Night one. We get that ever so iconic view of the office that started it all. We boop the FNAF bear's nose because funny. And then we get a call from the man himself. Hello? Hello? Uh, I wanted to record a message for Shut you. the fuck up! So yes, as I'm sure I don't need to explain to anybody at this point, but this is a plain and simple point and click game. We get to look left. 
And then we get to look right, interact with these two buttons on each side of the room, one turning on the light in the hallway, and the other one closing a security door that could stop riots at Guantanamo Bay. And if we hover our mouse over to this little tab here, we can bring up this pretty advanced little tablet for the 1990s, and it's from here where we're able to select between the different cameras around the pizzeria. And it's at this point, best of luck everybody, you're going to need it. Now for the uninitiated, what does one do in FNAF 1? Well, for starters, hopefully not get bored and stuffed into a suit that has the same amount of space in it as my fucking first apartment. Yes, in FNAF 1, the objective is simple. Survive. And to do said surviving, you're going to need to make it until 6 a.m. Only to repeat the cycle the following day, and that's pretty much it. You can't move from your tiny little office, even though that makes me question the mental stability of your main character, that he thinks that staying in this tiny little office while seven foot tall fursuits are out to get him is a smart idea, but I digress. So in order to not get your ass handed to you, you're going to need to keep track of where each of these animatronics are throughout the pizzeria, and you obviously need to utilize the cameras in order to do that. But in case you haven't noticed, this isn't exactly a fully 3D RTX level game we're playing over here. No, these are but mere little PNGs that we're staring at. So don't think that you're going to have real-time information fed to you so you can keep track of these animatronics. No, uh When they decide that being stuck in the broom closet isn't a fun idea anymore, they'll launch an EMP to momentarily blind the cameras so that they have ample time to relocate to a different area. Which in turn means you're going to have to be frantically switching between all the cameras just to find out where the hell they are. Now you have a total of 11 cameras that you can sift through, but the most important ones are going to be the four closest to you, because it's over here where you need to start keeping an eye out for whatever animatronic is closest to you, because if they get too close... Yeah, no, you're going to need to be as quick on your mouse to close that fucking door like you're a CSGO esports player. Now, I know what some of you might be thinking to yourselves. Okay, why can't I just keep the doors closed throughout the entire night? It just seems like that's the safest thing to do. Well then, you would be correct in that assumption, but since this is a horror game, things can't ever be that simple, now can it? Because as you can see here at the bottom left hand of your screen, you have two bars. One that shows how much power you have left, and another one that shows the amount of power you're currently using. Now, if you're a horror connoisseur like yours truly, then I'm pretty sure that I don't need to explain, but for the filthy casuals out there, every single thing that you do consumes power. Using the cameras, turning on the hallway lights, closing the door, leaving the fucking fan on on your desk, you know, you get the picture. Meaning that sure, you can leave the doors closed throughout the entire night, but would you have enough power to last you for the full six hours? Chances are probably not. And if you were a little bit greedy by using up every single little bit of power before you clock off from work, well, I have some bad news for you. Could you tell that that's not what's supposed to happen? Yes, enough dilly-dallying. Let me go into a bit more detail as to what goes on in FNAF. Each night starts at midnight, and the goal is to make it all the way to 6 a.m. And within that time, you need to keep an eye out for one of the four animatronics, namely Bonnie, Chica, Freddy, and Foxy. You already know who they are. Each of them behave in their own different ways. Bonnie will wander around the pizzeria and will normally approach from the left-hand side of the screen, and Chica will do the exact same thing but will always show up on the right hand side of the screen. Freddy does whatever the fuck he feels right, and Foxy is a little prick. Now, I should clarify that the footage that you're seeing here is from my playthrough I recorded for this video, and for a majority of it, I didn't really get an encounter from Foxy once. Reason for that being is because if you know how to cheese this game, it can get quite fucking easy. But how Foxy usually acts is like so. Foxy's main area is on Cam 1C at Pirate Cove. First off, the curtains will remain closed so that you can't see him. Then as the night progresses, he'll start making his presence known, and if you're not good at keeping an eye on him, motherfucker will make a mad dash to the left hand side of the map, meaning that you've got seconds to close that door on him before he comes for your booty. And judging how the fan base of this game is, I think that phrase holds two different meanings. Sometimes you're even able on rare occasions to get a jump scare from Golden Freddy.
ready and the oh so iconic it's me flashes on screen which i thankfully don't have to go into too much detail on here as to what they mean because thankfully there's millions of other channels that can do that for me i think the proper term for this is called networking and you need to survive all these trials and tribulations while making sure that you still at the very least have enough power to last you up until 6 a.m otherwise hearing the tripadors march is going to be something that you're gonna need to bring up to your therapist as to why you refuse to attend operas but thankfully though not all is lost you see i'm not sure how the countdown timer works in fnaf but i'm pretty sure it works on a fixed time and that also plays into the whole randomness nature of the game the clock is always going down constantly so that even if you end up fucking up your power consumption if you were literally 10 seconds off from beating the night and the power still dies you'll still be able to make it to the next night and let me tell you the satisfaction by just being able to scrape by night at the last possible moment is almost comparable to beating a level one enemy in a souls like and if you've been paying attention to what i've just said then that one single word is actually what defines the tenseness factor to fnaf's overall horror randomness everything in this game is randomized it's also quite cheesable if you know how to do it but everything from whomever decides to piss off from the main stage first to where they'll show up on the cameras to who'll show up at your door first is all randomized making it almost near impossible to be able to tell where each animatronic is now there is a level to each of these animatronics though that increases as the nights go on and early spoiler when you beat the game this is a level that you can tweak to your heart's content or do the funny cheat code <laughs> I'm not sorry. And this level, I'm just gonna say, has an impact on the overall animatronic's aggressiveness, meaning how frequently they'll be darting around the pizzeria, how frequently they'll show up at your door to check up on your car's extended warranty, and all sorts of stuff like that. And couple that with the sheer randomness that FNAF contains, you'll be flipping around characters and jolting your head left and right like you're busy taking a driver's test. Now, the only two factors that I'm not 100% sure on is when Freddy himself and Golden Freddy will show up. Fuck, if I'm going off of memory alone, I think Freddy can only be spotted in one of the cameras. And when he decides to jump scare your ass, I don't really think there's any way to counter that. But now that I've talked about the game's overall experience, allow me to shift focus from the gameplay and over to the game's presentation. I mean... They are very nice looking JPEGs. Every single frame of this game is iconic. Whether you're looking at the main stage with all the animatronics, Foxy peeking through the curtains in Pirate Cove, or seeing the eerie sights of Bonnie and Chica just standing right outside your office door. Every single frame oozes with tension, ripe for Luna AI exploitation. Hell, there's even some catching off guard moments in these frames that add to the horror experience. Like this one, for example, when you're looking in the parts and service room, you can sometimes catch a frame where these disembodied heads just stare at you. The same applies with Freddy on the main stage. Sometimes he'll look off to the side as if though he's schizophrenic, and sometimes he'll remember to take his meds and realize that someone's always watching. I love tiny little details like these that just adds to the game's overall horror atmosphere, because it can momentarily distract you from what you were busy doing so that you can confirm that what you saw was actually real. And moving over from all those random occurrences, this might be one of the first examples that I can think of of a game using liminal spaces to set an uneasy atmosphere to disturb the player. Because come on, as we all know, FNAF was primarily inspired by Chuck E. Cheese, and you just tell me that locations like these didn't creep you out like a motherfucker even when they were brightly lit during the day, let alone after hours. This sense of the familiarity with environments like these, coupled up with the mess of stuff that happens in this game, <coughs> is the perfect recipe for an excellent setting. Now, as a game that came out in 2014, FNAF 1 does kind of have a few rough edges if you just want to play the game vanilla nowadays. For starters, you guys have been seeing the game properly stretched to a full screen resolution, but for me, I was primarily looking at it through OBS like this. Yes, since this was a game that released all the way back in 2014, and it being an indie product, it playing at 1080p around the time isn't really something that should be expected. I mean, the game still played at the proper full screen while I was playing it, so that's a plus at the very least. But that does doesn't excuse one of the biggest issues with the game if you choose to play it nowadays. This issue, in fact, caused me a few times to fumble up a night and caused me more unnecessary stress and panic than it should have. You see, the game does play at a full screen resolution of 720p, but the problem with this is that the game isn't locked to an exclusive full screen. What does that mean exactly? Well, if you just 
choose to go willy-nilly with your mouse, it tends to veer off to the side onto your other monitor if you have one. And if you click off the game, it turns your screen black for a few seconds because you're no doubt playing this on a higher resolution monitor, and it'll take a few seconds for your screen to readjust itself. And you might be thinking to yourself, that doesn't sound like too big of a problem. And I agree with you. This wouldn't be as huge of a pain in the ass if it wasn't for the fact that FNAF doesn't have a pause feature. Yes, much like the Souls games that I'm no doubt sure FNAF was inspired by, every single night needs to be completed in one sitting. Because either you wait it out and hope you're not going to be the thing they'll be serving on the next day's menu, or you just have to quit out of the current night you're in, forcing you to need to restart when you want to come back. This little tiny issue led me to needing to be extra locked in while I was playing this, like a crack addict that was busy heading into relapse. Because with my cheese method, it needed me to be extra focused on not missing a single button, so I basically needed to have the reflexes of a Sekiro sweat to keep my run going. But sometimes I messed up and went off screen, but then whoops, I actually get jump scared by my desktop. Then I have seconds to hurry myself back to the game before the worst could happen. This is kind of annoying if you couldn't tell, but at the same time I'd argue that this somewhat helps with the game's horror, because if you fuck up and veer off screen because of carelessness, that adds even more panic and tension because when you load it back in, you might just accidentally return the moment you get jump scared, probably causing you to commit a little bit of brown or yellow. As for everything else though, I think for what this game is, and for everything that it does with the limitations of the engine that it was released on, I think that this game is one of the examples of a perfect horror game. Everything from it sounds messing with you, like playing Foxy's stupid laugh, the footsteps that for a fact isn't your super glued ass, gives you so much auditory confusion because you don't know what any of them could mean. Do the footsteps mean they're right outside your door, or could that mean they've just moved to another location on the map? Well, you wouldn't be able to know unless you shift focus your cameras and away from your two big ass doors. Also, the whole idea of limiting your item use to a finite amount of energy I also think was a brilliant choice, because every single thing you do requires a level of thought that harkens back to older style of survival horror games where you need to use whatever resources you had sparingly. And even if you're the most efficient with the uses of your doors, camera, that fucking fan that I swear pulls about 45% of the building's power at night, with the absolute randomness and aggressiveness of the animatronics in the following nights, it'll sometimes force you to have to use more resources than you're comfortable with. Like in my case when both Bonnie and Chica showed up at my doors and they wouldn't fuck off causing me to waste even more of my power, but still needing to keep my eye out for Freddy and Foxy. And the sheer panic I felt when shit like that happened was enough for me to pucker my asshole so tight I was able to fold inside out. And even when I was completely locked in and focused on not trying to get my ass handed to me, I was trembling like a little bitch because one small slip up could spell doom for me. And I just can't say that I've ever played a horror game or game in general that had such a humongous impact on me. Fuck, even games like Outlast or Alien Isolation games that are way more in line with what people consider to be proper survival horror games couldn't even nearly get me to the same amount of fear and tension that FNAF brought me. And couple that with some of the what the hell was that moments I previously mentioned like with Golden Freddy and the it's me shit, it causes more than enough panic to make you slightly not focus on the real issue at hand. And the fact that the game was able to do all of that whilst looking like one of those pop cap look for the hairbrush in the home of a horror games speaks volumes for how well Scott was able to craft a terrifying act atmosphere with such large limitations. But that also brings us to what a lot of people consider to be one of the game's biggest letdowns. It's just a bunch of PNGs that scream loud noises at you. And yes, you can't really give FNAF all that much praise when the criticism towards the games are pretty valid. Yes, all you're doing is sitting your ass down in one spot, flipping through a bunch of Windows XP wallpapers with the occasional furry dot PNG popping up in them. And if you mess up, a dot gif file jumps up at you with an extremely loud dot mp3 file. These criticisms are kind of valid, but I think people are missing the entire point when you look at the game through that point of view. Yes, it's not a fully 3D open map you can freely explore and play hide and seek from a bunch of con goers by hiding underneath a table or hiding in a closet. Yes, when you look at a game like that, this game isn't really all that special. But you tell me that if the first FNAF played in the same vein as something like Outlast, do you think that this game would work out nearly as well? Would going through five or six different nights in the same map with possibly more exploitable AI really hit the same way? I think that kind of novelty would run dry real 
real quick after like the fourth night. And I guarantee that if FNAF went in that direction, it would have quickly aged like a motherfucker, lessening the game's overall impact that it had. Because I feel like if it released in such a state, it would have just been considered a watered down Outlast clone. I think the switch to a more point and click style was the best move, because not only will the gameplay style probably age the best in terms of accessibility, but everything will just age the best in terms of its visuals and atmosphere because of it being a more stylistic choice. And like I've said, some of the flaws that this game still has nowadays causes it to have even more of a fear factor, so I'd almost argue that it aged even better with time. One of the other things I remember hearing about this game that makes total sense to me is that in FNAF, it's not the jump scare itself that scares the shit out of you, but it's the anticipation of it. And I think that's absolutely true. Humanity's biggest fear is the fear of the unknown, and going into this game with the mindset knowing that you're going to get jump scare, knowing that with one wrong move and you're fucked, but not knowing exactly when it's going to happen, is one of the key causes of dread for this game. And this feeling remains consistent with the rest of the games in the franchise, except for you. So since this is a super cool IGN level review part of the video, I 100% can still recommend that you pick up the first FNAF game. It's aged pretty damn well, and if you have two monitors, it's even better, because you're gonna have to make sure that you don't accidentally click off of the game, because the next thing you might see when you load back into the game is the same thing a doctor sees when they ask you to say ah. But now that we know what FNAF is and how good the actual game is, it didn't just stop there, because this game sent shockwaves not throughout the gaming industry, but in pop culture in general. And to look at FNAF's initial impact, we need to go to the one place that sparked its mainstream popularity. Now, as I'm sure we all should know by this point, YouTube in 2014 was a completely different place back then. It was a time when just popping on Bandicam and filming yourself playing Minecraft with a calm demeanor was more commonplace rather than the ear-piercing ADHD fuel we're used to nowadays. It was a time dominated by Let's Plays and gaming montages and an era before every single big YouTuber was getting out of this nonsense almost once every single month. And it was during this time that Let's Plays got a humongous explosion thanks to one certain upload. And I don't think I need to beat around the bush here, it's the one video that put both the game and its creator covering it on the map. On the 12th of August 2014, Markiplier would upload his first video on FNAF and then history was made. Everybody started covering this game in both let's plays, reviews, songs, animations, you fucking name it. FNAF broke out of the indie horror scene and pretty much into the mainstream almost instantly and both sparked Scott's desire to continue with the franchise but also sparked a lot of people's career when they decided to cover FNAF. It was just so fucking funny to go onto the internet back in the day and try to look for someone who was busy pissing themselves because of the funny bear. And obviously with such mainstream attention, of course that would almost instantly spell success for your game. Because if a YouTuber playing the game got close to like 100 million views on it, what do you think are the chances that at the very least 100,000 people chose to bite the bullet and buy the game for themselves? Either because they wanted something new to satiate their horror fix, they just wanted to see what all the hype was about, or to just make content for themselves, which in turn would expose them and the game they're covering to an even larger audience. And with Scott constantly pumping out sequel after sequel to this mega hit, that ensured both the success of his newly created franchise, as well as the people who decided to cover it in their own way. But not only did this game pretty much cement FNAF as a part of gaming history, as I'm sure if you've been watching this channel for a while now, whenever something tastes even the slightest bit of success, especially to the degree that FNAF got, obviously other people would try to take their own spin on what Scott created a decade to go. As I'm sure you know, horror is a medium that existed for literally decades at this point. Whether you look back at the old monster movies Universal pumped out back in the 1920s, or if you want to let this video hit more close to home and stuff like video games, stuff like Resident Evil and Silent Hill, horror has pretty much been a mainstay in media for as long as film and video games have existed. Now I'm not entirely sure what the take on horror games were by the time of FNAF's release, but I'm pretty sure that there was a bit of a drought. Mainstream horror franchises that were solely responsible for putting the genre on the 
the map were busy rubbing shoulders with the degenerates of Call of Duty like Resident Evil. And other franchises seemed to deviate more and more from what made its genre so good to begin with. And it wasn't until games like Outlast and Amnesia were released that I think the interest in horror was sparked again. But oh boy, let me tell you, when FNAF released back in 2014, everybody wanted to ditch trying to make asset flip Unity engine games starring the Slender Man. Nah, everybody wanted to take their own spin on the point and click survival horror game. So why not load up something like Scratch, upload your creation onto Game Jolt, and get ready to see what YouTuber would pick it up and cover the game on their channels. And that's what happened to a few of these kinds of games. We had games like Five Nights at Wario's, more famously Five Nights at Sonic's, FNAF clones of course featuring the respective Mario and Sonic characters. There was Five Nights at Treasure Island, based on the abandoned by Disney creepypasta, Five Nights at the Krusty Krab, and many more taking inspiration from FNAF and bunging in characters from already existing franchises. But if getting a cease and desist order from both Disney and Nintendo doesn't sound like a fun time to you, then maybe you can take the FNAF formula and create your very own little universe. And that's what some people did with games like Five Nights at Candy's or One Night at Flumpty's. And hell, these games were so successful that they even spun off into their own franchises. Some people actually went out of their way to try and expand the already established FNAF formula in other ways, most notably with games like The Joy of Creation and Juniors, one of which took the FNAF formula and incorporated elements of free roam into the equation, making it more in line with other horror games that you're probably more familiar with. And Juniors looking like it plays a hell of a lot more into the paranormal aspects of these games. But I'm not going to go into all of these games in this video alone. There's a hell of a lot more YouTubers that are qualified to do that. And not to mention, there's also a fuck ton of these games that both contain content and figures behind them that I'd rather think I'd let Sunny V2 make a video on them. But regardless, if you needed a FNAF fix after playing through every single game in the franchise, somebody out there definitely had you covered. But not only did FNAF inspire so many different games based off of its formula, much like my take on Resident Evil 4 and how that game was indirectly responsible for what caused the franchise to go in a bit of an identity crisis, FNAF would also be the catalyst of a subgenre that I don't think it could ever have predicted and sadly fell into itself. And I'm sure if you've watched any video on YouTube covering this type of topic and even on my own channel, then you probably know what two words I'm about to utter. Mascot horror. Now for those of you who aren't all that clued up on your internet lore yet, you might ask yourself, the fuck is mascot horror? So basically the whole aspect of mascot horror is taking characters that kids normally would love and plunge them into the lake of rot to contort them into these terrible demons that for some reason a select few people on the internet would like to fornicate with. Sure, I think the entire idea of taking these normally cute characters and then turning them homicidal is a concept that existed way before even FNAF, but this concept has never been as popular then as it is now, and I think that FNAF indirectly had an influence on this type of horror. The most notable games in this subgenre being Bendy and the Ink Machine, Hello Neighbor, Poppy Playtime, Garden of Banban, and the most recent addition being Indigo Park. But the biggest problem that this type of genre usually faces with the exception of a few games on this list is that a lot of these games focus a lot less on being good horror games and more so as to how they can be cash cows for their audiences. Yes, whether it be games like Hello Neighbor, Poppy Playtime or Garden of Banban, a humongous part of these games' existence are more to sell merch aside from just being good games, because they primarily depend on the recognizability of their main mascot from either the game or from whichever YouTuber covered it and tried to maximize the amount of profit by selling all sorts of shit kids would bankrupt their entire families for in an instant. Now like I said, there are a few exceptions to this rule because other games that can be classified as mascot horror, like Bendy and Indigo Park, don't really seem to fall under the overly monetized moniker. Sure, they do have merch, but I don't think they place as huge of an emphasis on it like let's say the devs behind Poppy Playtime, who if I need to remind you, actually went as far as to make fucking NFTs, so just let that shit sink in for a second. And the reason why I say that even FNAF itself wasn't really safe from the mascot horror plague, then we need not look further than 2021's Security Breach, one of the most broken, non-scary and basic horror games I think I've played in my entire life, that I 100% think lost what made FNAF so terrifying to begin with just because it wanted to jump on the mascot horror trend. Yes, the game itself is still fun when you're just taking the piss out of it, but I'm pretty sure that's not what Steel Wool Studio had in mind when they were making this. Thankfully though, with the release of FNAF Ruin as well as Help Wanted 2, it seems that they finally woke up and remembered what made FNAF so good to begin with, but fucking hell man, with how massive FNAF is, I wouldn't be surprised if they just doubled down and tried something similar again later down the line.
But with all of that out of the way, I think it's time that we start wrapping this video up. Despite all my critiques on where FNAF went in the last part, like how it pretty much fed into the subgenre of mascot horror it indirectly helped create, that still doesn't change the fact that FNAF will go down as one of the most influential, not just indie games, but games in general. And it's safe to say that FNAF left a pretty massive impact on a lot of people, whether or not it just be YouTubers like Markiplier, MatPat, musicians and animators like The Living Tombstone and Pymations, but I think the most important impact that it left was on the fans that to this day still love these games. Everybody is at the very least going to have one fond memory about playing FNAF, whether they were just goofing off with a bunch of buddies or see who is going to piss themselves first when Foxy jumps out at them after seeing him run down the hallway. I'm sure everybody has at least one memory like that of playing FNAF for their first time. And like many games that have left an impact, this is a franchise that just means so much to so many different people. There's a reason people will spend hours upon hours upon hours discussing theories with other fans. There's a reason people will spend hours and hours drawing fan art and other kinds of arts of their favorite characters. There's reasons people will go to conventions with the most realistic looking Springtrap cosplay that I don't even think Hollywood would be able to recreate. And speaking of Hollywood, there's a reason that FNAF's mainstream success led to them even making a full feature length film. Because I don't think that besides maybe a game like Minecraft, there's been an indie game that has left such a huge impact on modern day pop culture like Five Nights at Freddy's. And I guess with more games and more stuff coming out as time moves forward, I don't think that FNAF is going to be losing steam anytime soon. And while it might not be as massive as it was back when it came out, I think it's safe to say that this was the impact left by Five Nights at Freddy's 10 years later.